abuse of leave charges in the absence of convincing documentation. Here's the Secretary of Labor rebuking employees at EPA when the EPA people, their superiors, did not take the same action. What does that say about what's going on at EPA? When people with such a slipshod approach to their management duties are responsible for protecting the drinking water supply of the United States, all who use public water supplies are at risk. It's this pervasive, slipshod attitude set by two of the most important U.S. government officials responsible for protecting the health and safety of public water supplies that in no small way contributed to the latest in a series of public health disasters, such as the recent boil water order from the District of Columbia. Yet the true scientists, such as Dr. Joseph Petruvo, who still had the Criteria Standards Division at EPA, I am absolutely sure to this day that none of these things would have happened. The second and, and an even more frightening aspect of my case is the role of the Office of Inspector General. It would appear, based on the documentation produced by the Inspector General, that they were working for the benefit of several chemical companies. It is clear that the initial investigation was initiated after complaints were voiced by a large chemical company. And that occurred in April of 1988. The evidence gathered by the Inspector General's office shows unequivocally that by the end of May 1988, there was absolutely no basis for any of these charges. Yet they persisted. Fighting the federal government is by no means an easy task. In my or any other whistleblower's case, you face an implacable foe who has unlimited resources. In EPA's case, once their lawyers become involved, they will fight on to cost the whistleblower as much money and take as long as possible to draw out the final verdict. Since they have jobs, the lawyers have jobs, and their job depends upon not winning or doing what is right, but on fighting, they will fight on forever, justifying their need to be on staff to continue that fight. It is a vicious circle in which the costs to the taxpayer are never considered. Once the Office of General Counsel knew that the case against me was bogus and unfair and without merit, they proceeded with it anyway. It is true that justice grinds exceeding fine. This process takes time. In my case, and in all the others that I'm aware of, there is a prodigious loss of income. My family suffered mightily. Initially, there's an embarrassment of being fired and having to explain time and time again that this action was wholly unfair and why it was unfair. What tried my patience and grated on my nerves is that in general, the benefit of the doubt was given to the government. Secondarily is that every potential employer in the metropolitan area was afraid to hire me because, and I quote, a substantial part of their business is conducted with EPA and they do not want to anger the hand that feeds them." Unquote. What's an innocent person to do? His means of livelihood is snatched from him. An expensive lawsuit will surely follow. Inevitably, bills arrive. Mortgages must be paid. College fees must be paid. And suddenly, the income necessary to pay all these expenses is absent. That scenario frightens even the most honest and responsible federal worker. And well, it might, because it happened to me and my family. Injustice to me and my family was particularly hard. My daughters changed their plans for an education. My older daughter had to postpone her plans for medical school until the money could be found to pay for it. My health suffered. My blood pressure went up. I gained weight. And I developed chronic irritable bowel syndrome. My wife's health was affected. She could no longer sleep. She constantly worried about medical coverage after the COBRA ran out. And she determined privately financed health plans routinely would exclude her because of her history of breast cancer. And if, co if coverage were offered and at astronomical prices, a recurrence of breast cancer would be excluded from coverage. Her stomach was constantly in an uproar. But what of the scientists who are timid and who feel that their first loyalty, 
is to their families. This is the chilling effect that my experience at the United States Environmental Protection Agency has had on my fellow scientists. How can the public be protected when the people charged with this mission are afraid that telling an unpopular truth, or as in my case, writing a position paper that does not conform with already established policy results in their firing? Let me tell you a story. Only two weeks ago, I received a call from an EPA friend, a fellow colleague, an internationally well-known colleague and respected scientist. My colleague told me that recently compiled data shows that one of the causes of breast cancer One of the causes of breast cancer is an increase in a particular enzyme in breast tissue. Furthermore, it has been shown that some well-known pesticides cause between a four and eight-fold increase in that tissue and that enzyme, and therefore may contribute in a, in a substantial way to the epidemic of breast cancer now occurring in this country. My friend said, Bill, will you please put, put your name on that paper? Because if mine appears, I'm afraid they will fire me. I'm afraid they'll fire me. I'm afraid they will fire me. Let those words ring in your ears. I have a personal interest in breast cancer because my wife had it 11 years ago. I have two daughters who are at risk, perhaps because of these pesticides that are in the food chain. But not only my wife and daughters are at risk, our mothers, our wives, our sisters, our daughters, indeed all the women in the United States remain at risk. I'm afraid they will fire me. This is what has happened to the scientists at the United States Environmental Protection Agencies, whose conscience dictates that they honor their oath to serve and protect the US public, but who also know that they need to keep their jobs, and who know that being fired by the government means that they may never work in their chosen field again. I want to say this again. The Secretary of Labor has issued an unprecedented rebuke to the Inspector General's Office of EPA. But more importantly, nobody at EPA has taken any remedial action concerning the illegal and felonious activities by the representatives of the Office of Inspector General. I would like to ask all of you gathered here today to ask Carol Browner, the Administrator of EPA, and Kimberly Tilley, Deputy Chief of Staff, for strategic planning at the EPA, why they depend upon an Inspector General who himself has been singled out for criticism in one of the Congressman Dingell's reports and who encourages and rewards such licentious actions. These actions which ultimately tarnish the United States Environmental Protection Agency and cause our agency to become suspect in the eyes of the very public that they are there to serve and protect. 